Welcome back to the stage, everyone. We have a super special treat for you during this segment. Uh, you will meet two fantastic Welcome back to the teachers. stage. Oh, that was that was me. Is that gone now? Yes. Okay. Um, what I was saying is that we have fantastic teachers with us this morning from Atlanta Public Schools. And this session is going to be moderated by our one and only Terry Foster, who is our Constellations Fellow. Uh, he's a senior Constellations Fellow, actually. He's been with the program for a little, um, little more than two years um, and has done a phenomenal job with working with teachers, um, has contributed so much to the work and the research that we're doing at the Constellation Center here at Georgia Tech. Um, we have integrated many of his ideas and his implementation um, into our research. And I'm just so happy that he's able to facilitate this session. Um, and I want to emphasize the importance of lifting teachers' voices throughout the summit. Um, not only are they dedicated to equity and CS, but they are dedicated to the needs of their students. And they are here today to share their experiences to help other teachers uh, and convey the importance of teachers and the importance of nurturing and cultivating a community of teachers so that they are ready to help foster the kinds of students that we need for our nation. So with that, I am going to hand it over to you, Terry. And um, I am going to sit back and watch, and I hope everybody enjoys this segment. Thank you all. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I am so happy and proud to be here, um, especially um, in the company of these two amazing teachers. Um, they were first year computer science teachers, but they blew it out of the water, um, both of them. Um, yes, yes. Um, we got together last summer um, during a PD and they took the initiative and just really drove um, planning out for the coming year, the coming uh, 20 or 19, 20 year. And um, I'm just so proud of them and their accomplishments and what they've done so far in year one. Um, but I don't want to take up their time. I'm going to introduce them to you all, um, starting with Mrs. Miles, who has been a math educator for almost 20 years has seen the immense need for computer science to be, to be compulsory part of traditional education. While CS is certainly a portion of STEAM pathway, she sees how understanding the basis of CS can lead not to just a job, but a way of thinking. Exposing as many students as possible to this computational way of thinking has become a fiber in the fabric of who she is becoming. Mr. Guy is teaching computer science and geometry his first year with the 2019-2020 school year and has learned a great deal. This year, he brought hardship and triumph as well as a challenging end to the virtual landscape. Before teaching, Mr. Guy worked seven years as, a, as an actuary and utilized computer science techniques to streamline data processing and help catch anomalies and errors in census data. Having this real world experience of applying the concepts learned in computer science has been invaluable when working in the classroom. So without further ado, I will introduce to you the superstars, the rock stars, Mrs. Miles and Mr. Guy. Too much. Um, so I'll let, <laughs> welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you here. So I'm gonna let David get us started. Um, we wanna make sure that this is as interactive as possible. So David? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And thank you, Ms. Miles. Um, the, screen share the of the menti.com I have there. Uh, you can just on a phone, on your device, you can actually probably open another tab on your computer and just join our session. I see people are punching little hearts so we can see kind of who's who's in it already. Um, and the uh, the goal here is just to kind of get some feedback. We're going to speak about our experiences, our vision about what uh, computer science can look like in Atlanta public schools um, and then just give you some of our um, of our experiences. Um, so it looks like we got a good number of people already joined and uh, it, every slide shows the login 
So um, I think in the chat, Ms. Uh, Terry, if you want to just write the, the login for the slide deck, and then um, I'm going to move to the next slide here. So um, this is just give you who we are, where we worked, which schools we're at. Um, and thought we could start with um, just wanted to kind of see what's been going on with this summit. Um, this is a word share. So it's really just we want to get like a word that kind of distills what it is that you've been gaining. What have you been getting from this summit? Um, so here we see communities. So just kind of submit. You can submit multiple times and we'll see what kind of rises to the surface here um, about what it is that we're learning. Uh, what are we getting out of this virtual summit? And I know personally, I'm I'm getting a lot of it's just refreshing ideas, refreshing um, perspectives. And I sat in a K five session that you know I'm not supposed to because I'm in high school, and um, that really was amazing to hear about what elementary students are experiencing with computer science. Right. And I think I was also in that session. You're talking about with the AI. Mm hmm. Yes. And um. But to your point, while they continue to post, one idea that sparked in me was if we're really going to affect change on the high school level, and I'll talk a little bit about this more la later, but um, we really do have to start younger and younger to just get them get that stigma out of the way for our students. So I thought that was awesome. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you, everyone, for uh, writing here. I see community is the main thing. I mean, again, that's I think that's the, one of the major goals of these types of um, gatherings is to really see who, who else is out there um, producing, fighting for, creating all these new um, resources and, and ideas for the teachers to implement. You know, that's yeah. a, I guess that's where the rubber hits the road is in the classroom. Right. What so else do you see, Ms. Miles? Say it again, I'm sorry. I'm just asking, what do you see on the word wall you'd like to speak about? Well, I'm, I'm loving the fact that um, what's unexpected to me is specifically the community's per perspective. I think when people think about computer science, they don't think of anything, anything social, anything um, community or integrated. So it's very heartening to me that the one thing that this conference is bringing out, we're midway, right? It's bringing out a sense of community. Because, um, you know, it can be isolating because you might be the only one in your building who even understands half of what's happening. Um, and I love the fact that I see resources and equity kind of like on par with each other. That is awesome. I think that's just such a great testament to this particular conference. And I think I think it's going to be a very um, huge thing moving forward. <laughs> exactly. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on. So, again, I. I see there's still words popping up, but uh, we're gonna move on. So thank you everyone. Um, and now we'll just talk about who who we are. Um, and we'll start with uh, where and what do we teach? So Mrs. Miles, why don't you start for us? All right, I teach at North Atlanta High School. Um, it's, north, it's the Northern part of the city. And um, traditionally, I teach math, any math I can teach. I do not mess with calculus, though, not because I can't do it, but because when you get to that level of math, um, the parent is very interesting. Not the student, the parent is very interesting. So I kind of back away from those senior classes. Um, so this past year, I taught Algebra 2. And of course, last year was my inaugural year in teaching AP Computer Science Principles, and we'll be adding a Computer Science A next year. David. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I am, I teach at Maynard Jackson High School, which is uh, formerly the South Side uh, South Side High School. Mm -hmm. um, and I teach geometry. Or I taught. So sorry, I taught geometry, and I taught computer science. And so next year I'll be teaching algebra and computer science principles and computer science A, uh, the advanced class. 
Um, okay, and then next, uh, just what is our what is our background? So I think that was kind of the important part of this panel was we come from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I'll start. Um, I'm a veteran teacher, although I wasn't traditionally trained. I went to Penn State. I majored in kinesiology, so who knows what that is? You know, basically, I could have been a doctor, a personal trainer, an athletic trainer, um, a sports, you know, agent. You know, it's that broad. Um, I chose to do the exercise science portion of it. So I really could have come out and done something in the medical profession, but I was tired, um, to be honest. It was a rigorous program. I did well, but I was tired. And I said, well, what have I done these four years, you know, that I'm good at and it's effortless. I don't want to have to think about it. I'm like, well, I've tutored and I taught. And so all of a sudden I find myself in Teach for America. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. So I did Teach for America. Um, and then I said, I'm going to do my three years and I'm going to go and be a physical therapist. And um, that was literally in 2000. I finished in 2004. And we see how many years I've been in education since then. Um, so. I have a heart for education. I recognize I have an aptitude for teaching. Um, I really sincerely feel like even if I went into the medical field anywhere, I would be in a clinical teaching hospital um, because that's just my heart. My heart is for teaching and to have people, you know, um, do better. So I'm, I'm experienced in pedagogy, in other words. Um, I have a heart for pedagogy. I have a heart for students. I have a heart for people. Um, I took one measly computer science course in 1996 called Pascal Programming, when printers still ran through things that you had to turn the paper to go through. So that was my one and only experience with computer science. Thank Dave you. <laughs> uh, so my background is I went from undergrad into the industry. I was a math major. And I worked in uh, consulting, actuarial consulting. So what is that? What is that word? OK, the <laughs> risk we were looking at, basically looking at projecting things into the future, trying to model stuff. Um, so the computer science isn't really like the forefront. It was more of a financial risk analyst sort of background. And I found myself. Uh, really engaged in how do I incorporate using computer science? This, I mean, there was no one telling me to do this. I just found myself doing kind of menial typing and going, what, what can I do <laughs> to really automate this? So next year I can just like click a few buttons. There it is. And um, so that's what got me really in that, in that space interested in computer science. So I really don't have a formal background in it. And um, it was one of those things where I actually ex got exposed to it in a high school setting under this class called Introduction to Programming. Um, and it was just sort of one of those things that subject matters before had kind of come up. Oh, yeah, I like science. I like math. This class, I blew through the material, I think, in about the first few weeks or, you know, I. I paced myself the same with the class. And then after the first few weeks, I started just to kind of leap ahead. And I spent the rest of the semester making a giant game that had no credit. It got no recognition. I think the file got deleted at the end of the semester. But it didn't really matter to me that I, did, I lost all that. It was like the experience of creating something just was something that I would like to instill in my students. It has nothing to do with a grade. It has nothing to do with um, a, a gold prize or anything like that. It's just, can you get that feeling, that sensation of, I want to create this just for my own interest, curiosity. Um, so I hope that, you know, my background being in, in the industry wasn't really like I am a senior network engineer. It was really that I could see computer science placed in so many facets of just about every job that's on a computer um to me that's my message to my students is less about pursue computer science as a um field and more of how do you build computer science into your interest okay and then who are our students um so at north atlanta it's really diverse and when i say diverse Socioeconomically is diverse um, and from a racial perspective is diverse. 
So we have um, last numbers that I saw, and it could be different, 38% white, 33% African-American, about 23% Hispanic, and then the remainder is Asian, multi-racial, um, and other. Um, so it's a really diverse population. It's actually 51, 51-49, or, or it's almost 50-50 male and female. Um, so that's our actual population. Um, and we'll talk about goals later, but that's where I teach. And my high school is in Southeast Atlanta. Uh, we are about 85% or 80% African-American, um, 10, 10, 15% of, uh, the population is white or mixed race. And, uh, about 5% is, uh, Latina, of Latino. Um, and our free or reduced lunch population is about half, a little over half. The um, gender breakdown is about 50 50. Mm-hmm. And I probably um, should mention that too. Our um, free and reduced lunch is 27% at last count. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think we're, we're both uh, seeing just a, a, a mix, a cross section of the Atlanta population. Um, and um, perhaps it's more, uh, you know, computer science. I think we'll, we'll get into this pooled a specific population over others too. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, that's a little bit about us. Now we want to know about you. So this is a, uh, another word wall where you can just, um, tell us if you're in, um, what brings you to the summit? Are you in education? Are you in curriculum? Are you in administration? Are you in policy? Are you in industry? Are you a student? Are you a parent? Mm -hmm. So just tell us where you're at, because we like to know who our audience is. Um, Even if we could see you, we we wouldn't know what setting you're in. And we're doing this also because we want to kind of tailor the conversation. Um, so if we're talking to, and I see it's mostly people who are already in education from what I'm seeing. But if we're talking to people who like have no dog in the fight with policy changes specifically, then there's no point in us really harping on that. If it's mostly people who are in education, like they're the boots on the ground, then we need to share more of the pitfalls that we had, you know, and things that we definitely are not doing again, you know, or we're gonna try not to do next next year and following years, or things, and then talk about things that like really worked well. And once again, we're really looking at the things that um, I think our, our main point is that we experience a lot of the same stuff, right? But we're gonna we kind of approaching it or going at it maybe different ways. But it's like, dang, we still had some of the same issues. I think that's the main point that we wanted to put out. Okay. Oh, that's some parents. Yeah. So I see some education, education, of course, I think that's why we're here. (laughs) Um, Right. So again, so all these sessions would have been very, what has been very helpful is go to this website and tinker around with this resource. And, you know, we're doing that live in the session. So, um, you know, that's kind of how uh, we're, we're approaching this panel is just to kind of give you, maybe some more of the qualitative experience. Yep. Um, yeah. I see a math teacher. Here we are, two math teachers. Um, so it's it's interesting. Sometimes we have to wear different hats during the day or is it the same hat? Good question. Yeah. Yep. Um, cool. All right. CS education, physical science. All um, right. Curriculum, CTAE. So for anyone outside of Georgia, CTAE, is uh, what is the C? Career, engineer career, <laughs> right, career right. and technical. <laughs> career, technical, ed- agriculture, and ed- and engineering. So, yes. basically, the Department of Education has said there needs to be at least you know at least some curriculum in our high schools that teaches students some real skills that they can take and have mm-hmm. pathways that they can graduate high school and almost go immediately into an industry. Uh, with a high school diploma. So that's the CTAE um, department of the Department of Education. Yeah. Now, both of us, are, I'm, I'm housed in the math department. Are you housed in the math department as well? I am too. I okay. Am. 
So the interesting distinction, computer science typically falls in CTAE and we're math teachers. So it's, I think, I think we're seeing those subjects kind of bridge maybe we're the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. Yeah, I have a soapbox uh, moment about that later. <laughs> We can't yeah. hear you, Terry, well, if you're talking um, to Okay. So thank you, everyone. I, can you I, hear me now? I, yeah, yeah, I can hear you, Terry. Okay. I was going to say it's interesting about your soapbox. Um, there was a comment from um, Vicki Robertson about um, she teaches coding for sixth through eighth graders in Norcross, and um, she was drafted by her principal because she thought that her principal thought she had good logic. Um, and I was going to ask you guys, why do you think you were selected um, to teach computer science in your schools? I'll let you go first, David. OK, <laughs> well, um, you know, just having on my resume that I knew SQL coding, I think, was kind of the major like tick that this this is someone who's done it. Um, and I think the willingness when my prince, the principal who hired me, he called me after the interview and said, Hey, we have the situation where there's a computer science, you know, class that we want to teach. Are you willing to do it? I had really no hesitation, um, just because I felt like I I wanted to teach that. I could see the usefulness in it. So I don't know how special I was, or at least just that like I got lucky. No, I don't think it was necessarily like I was I was picked out of a candidate pool. I think it was just I got real lucky and so you were. So. <laughs> you were. <laughs> um. For me, um, I came to North Atlanta. I've been in Atlanta Public Schools since 2007. I left for one year. Believe it or not, to get an associate's in biology, I was bored. So I wanted to take organic chemistry, right? Um, I came back to the system to North Atlanta and I just began to look around. Well, having been gone back to school and seeing what education looked like then based on where I was from before, um, I saw some changes, right? And so when I got to North Atlanta, I'm looking at a very stable environment, a very um, mixed environment, socioeconomically mixed, racially mixed. And I'm looking at students who I know for sure can handle the content. And so I just started asking around, you know, your first year anywhere, you don't you don't make a lot of waves. You just observe and report. Right. And so I'm like, well, why don't we have a computer science course? And I, I went and talked to my administrator and she's very supportive. Dr. Angela Mitchell, she's very supportive um, of just about anything I bring to her. And I asked, you know, like, why don't we have an AP computer science course? Um, we do have, we did have computer science, but I don't know that it actually led to a pathway. You know, something that the students got to hang their hats on and say, I, I accomplished this, right? Um, for me, I'm a mom of seven. Okay, I gave birth to six. And so when I'm looking at my own children, when they finish high school, when they matriculate, I want them to be able to go out in the world and not just get a higher education like degree or whatever. I want them to have, have skills to use while I take that same approach with my own students. Okay. So in year two, I went to my minute, I'm like, well, why don't we have this? And then she said, well, there's this guy who keeps trying to get computer science over here. And we don't really know, we don't really have the infrastructure. And I was like, we do. I was like, I'm volunteering. And I said, I'll learn whatever you need me to learn. I'll go to whatever class you need me to go to class. But I let her know emphatically, like I need to be taught. The last thing computer science I had, like I told you all is 1996. I'm like, I need to be taught in order to be proficient with these students. Or you need to set, have something where it's already kind of set up where all I'm doing is guiding the students through until I get to be proficient. And so then finally, I think spring 20 something, um, Terry and I actually had a, a conversation. We actually had to talk and it was amazing. Like all of the things that the Constellations program was wanting to do are all the things that are at the heart of what I wanna do with students in general and then specifically for computer science. So in that following fall, we didn't get it that following fall. And I'm glad we didn't because the previous program that they would have implemented would not have been conducive to where I am as a teacher and then where my students are at all. And so we finally were able to get it, you know, in the building through AP Computer Science Principles, you know, this past fall, even with everything that's happened. As a matter of fact, I started my inaugural year on maternity leave. So I didn't come back until October. And out of 33 students, I had, um, I think, 21 who actually submitted, you know, the, the 
whatever tasks they had to submit and fully mm -hmm. submitted them. And so I think with everything that happens um, and not, not the students that you would expect, some of the students that I expected to submit did not. And that really surprised me. So that's where that's I guess that's a long story to say, like, that was my entry point. It was I see the need of computer science um, just for now and for the future. At one point, if you want to do it a higher education, you had to read well, you know, in history. At another point, I'm going to say 60s and 70s, you had to really know math. Like, you know, you had to have algebra on your transcript to be accepted into the major universities. You know, so we'll say 60s, 70s. And then in the 90s, it was algebra. For real, for real, you had to know algebra and calculus, you know, kind of had to be on your transcript to be considered to major universities. I fully believe that in these next 10 years, when you go to apply to a higher institution, they're going to be see, do you do you understand? Have you taken at least one computer science course? And there's going to be somewhere and maybe I'm being prophetic. There's going to be somewhere they're going to want to know, can you think computationally? I don't care what your major is going to be. I really think that that's going to be the next wave of um, entry into higher education. That was well stated. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mrs. Miles. I love when you get on your thought boxes. Um, there was also, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Oh, uh, there was also a question from um, Jim Hook. Um, he's in Oregon and he's a CTE participation. Oh, I'm saying he's, I'm sorry, he said CTE participation by subject area is highly gender tract is that an issue in georgia mm. um i'll speak to that just because i've been in education a little bit longer um for georgia let's let's speak plain and shame the devil right so we know in education that people track everything and that's not what you're supposed to do correct so one of the things that one of the things that david and i really wanted to point out um through this talk is we have to stop that specifically. We have to stop looking at a particular type of student, right? And automatically assigning a role to them or automatically assuming that, you know, this is what it's going to be. For example, in my building, um, we have a really strong CTAE program. Um, specifically, I can't, I'm going to get the actual programs wrong. I'm just going to say that at a time. So our visual arts programs, um, our FBL, whatever is associated with our FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America, that's very strong. And then there are some CTA things that are attached to our arts. And in my building, they do a really good job of not, you know, genderizing things, if you will. However, I've been in building buildings where they're like, oh, clearly you'll want to do this because you fit this outward mold, where they don't even give the students an opportunity to really see what these courses are about. Um, and then unfortunately you, you end up having these classes that are not rich and they end up being dumping grounds. You know, like um, I know my first year at North Atlanta, there was one course where it became the dumping ground for the ESOL students. And many of them didn't even want to be there. It's, it wasn't their interest. It wasn't even, it didn't even make sense for where they were in their coursework. Okay, it was just, they had a hole in their schedule there was space in this particular teacher's class. And then all of a sudden they, they went, they were programmed there. Um, from a gender perspective, yes, we've done that. In our building, we've, like I said, my first year there, it was like that. They've since gotten better. The only reason why they've gotten better, and I will say this, our teachers, the administration really does give our teachers agency. So if something's kind of happening in the building um, or course-wise that is kind of hanky, our educators have been given the agency to speak up and say, this is not right. But then they have to have kind of the evidence behind that to say why it's not right to really move the change. So other buildings, yes, it is. Our building, it used to be that way. It's less like that now. David, what can you say about your building? Do you know? I'm sorry. I've really, you know, it's first year teaching my uh, my head was in the math department almost all the time and so I didn't see a chance to branch out my uh, my colleague I graduated from Georgia State with worked at he was the engineering teacher and I know that his class was primarily male um, now our robotics team was highly mixed so I, I don't you know so I, I guess I can only speak to what I know and that's the classes the courses seemed um, 
the ones that I knew seemed to be driven to a male male dominant group, but then the actual this was much more diverse if you see the robotics team. Um, so that's it. So I guess I kind of like to, to, we can kind of drive the conversation to where we kind of want to be at this stage. Since we have mostly educators or people who are in education, um, one of the things that David and I really wanted to kind of talk about is how do we diversify these classrooms, right? What are some pitfalls that we saw that we did or encountered last year that we're definitely not going to do next year? And what are some things that we've learned that we definitely want to propagate forward? Um, so for me, for, for instance, um, I think I had 15 students who were of color, okay? Of those 15 students, I only had five who were girls. So 33 students, five who were girls. I remember in the beginning, our school is 50-50. And so one of the goals that I said to my administrator was, you can give me whatever you want this year, just to populate the class. And initially they said, well, we probably only have like 15. I said, give me five, I don't care. And we ended up with 33. So that was the first thing. Um, but I told her by year three, by year three of the program, our classes, principals as well as maybe not so much A, but principals for sure, because it's an entry level coursework, it should look like the building. You can't sit here and tell me that there are not girls who aren't interested in robotics, computer science, information technology. You can't tell me that. Like, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think that. You can't tell me that there aren't Latinx and African-American students who are not interested in how their iPad, their iPad, their iPods work. Like you can't tell me that that doesn't exist. And so one of the things that I've charged myself with, um, one mistake that I would say I did last year was not bringing computer science to a practical perspective enough because I was trying to get through the coursework. So fine, so I realize now that moving forward, um, there's one one major thing that I'm going to change moving forward is those offline activities that actually relate to physical computing or seeing how these computational ideas actually exist in the real world, especially now that we only have the create task, right? That's the only task that we have. Um, it's so vital for them to see why these big words, algorithms and abstractions, mm -hmm. you know, what, what does that actually really mean in the real world? Um, but starting earlier about that, and then I know this is a lofty goal, but finding a way, finding my way to the middle school, plain and simple. I have to find my way with my students um, to the middle school. I did a little research about, well, what's best practice? You know, what would diversify any classroom anywhere? Well, we know when students are learning from someone who looks like them, they're more inclined to participate. Okay. So I'm an African-American female. I'm not surprised that my African-American female sat near my desk. Not surprised at all. When they chose to sit somewhere, they sat near me. Um, when we had group activities or we had activities where students had to kind of talk to each other, I'm not surprised that they kind of gravitated together, right? Um, so one thing that I'm moving forward is making sure that one, my students can see themselves in the content in the industry through some unplugged or, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do it, mentorship opportunities. David. No, certainly I, um, I experienced almost more of a stark situation where our school is, as you heard from the percentages, a majority black student population. And my classroom setting was about the opposite. Um, and I think that goes back to the the situation of enrollment was like very last minute and they reached out to a charter school in our, they were the ones that actually signed up a lot of students. And so my class kind of reflected this charter school more than it did the high school. Mm. And uh, so I think that the, the next step would be to reach out to numerous you know, the, the school itself I'm in, the freshman population and, and the middle school, the other feeder middle school. Um, and the, you know, I, I, I think about how I actually incorporated a little bit of computer science, not necessarily programming, but just using apps in my geometry class. And I had a, a lot of young women um, 
that just excelled at it. And they were kind of like, can we do that more? Can we do that more? Um, and they, but they would end up with like a B or a high C in my math class. And I don't think it has anything to do with their ability. It was just that they were like, I know this. I don't need to try. That attitude to think of like when you miss out, that maybe they missed out on being considered gifted or honors and um, that boredom sunk in. And so math class is like, boom, I don't want to do it. And I think, unfortunately, this like the principal's class. So we're talking about the principal's class mostly. It has more prerequisites, but something's limiting the enrollment. And typically it's it's like an algebra kind of, uh, do they have a handle on algebra? And I, and I forget the exact language that College Board uses, but there is some sort of suggested prerequisite. And I would almost, and, and so what I thought was really promising this year was we did a um, computer science carnival. And so this this was like, this was like sweat and like every, like the, the fellows, Mr. Foster right here, Terry, y'all did a great job of yes. like presenting computer science to the, to the general student population. We didn't have like, we think you're good for computer science. We were like, all right, if you're in a freshman, come on down, come check it out. And, you know, you could see students who didn't really know what computer science was essentially going, oh, okay, so this is kind of like math on a computer um, <laughs> or maybe the game I'm making. But anyways, I think our enrollment numbers should look a lot different next year mm -hmm. because of that exposure in a in the school. It wasn't extracurricular. It wasn't like something they had to go get on a bus and to go somewhere else. Like this was housed in the school and it was actually during class time. So there was no real uh, like barrier for that student just to get exposed. So I think stuff like that um, and then um, just, I know I, I, I need to be more in conversation with the middle school counselors and see about maybe their math or science teachers, if they have a suggestion, because like, well, you talked about Ms. Ma Mrs. Miles in one of our, se our sessions planning for this computer science. Sure. It's mathematical, but at the end of the day, it's logic. That's what we're doing. Mm hmm and what's funny is that when we got to these like create tasks, you need a logical operator was one of the requirements in the, in the computer science principles. You need a logical operator. That's the language mm -hmm. we use. My students are like, well, what's that? And I kind of was like, oh man, you know, teacher moment. Like, I, I can't believe I didn't teach them a logical operator. Well, here we go, it's, you know, near the end of the school year. But to me, it's almost like, can that be reinforced the whole time? Do you like puzzles? Do you like, you know, can you break down just maybe they don't have to like write the code, but can you see what's happening? Um, that's the goal for computer science. I, I think sometimes we limit the student because if they don't have interest in computers, then they wouldn't have interest in the computer science. Well, I think we should look at it differently. Like, do they have interest in problem solving, puzzles, logic, mm -hmm. crosswords, anything like that? Maybe that's a different avenue for a, a candidate. Right. And I think the other thing that is kind of the elephant in the room that we as teachers kind of feel just total transparency kind of powerless in is that we're not the actual schedulers, right? And so um, unless you have an established relationship with the counseling department or you have a good relationship with your administrators, it's sometimes hard to convince them that this C student in algebra, right? can do well in a computer science course. For example, um, the initial, you know, College Board has their set, you know, of suggestions, right? But the initial um, requirements that my counseling department and my administration set forth for computer science, to me, already delimited, like 80% of the people that I would even consider to be eligible for computer science. And so when we talk about next steps, I'm an advocate. So what I realized very quickly is that I am the actual advocate for students that I don't even know yet. Like I really am. And so this so this past spring, I really sat and thought about like, okay, what should be the actual requirements, right? Because we can't, um, you do have to think on a certain level, like let's just be real, right? You do have to be able to think logically. 
So I said, you know, it doesn't have to be that you have this particular, you know, you're in, in Georgia, we have um, proficient and distinguished are like the two higher um, delineations when you take the algebra EOC or the geometry EOC. And so they wanted like distinguished. And I was like, oh, no, because mm -mm, you've already taken a lot of people out of the game that would do really well in this course. And so I'm like, well, listen, if you have an 85 or over on the actual EOC, you're already in good shape. If you're doing well, and when I say well, I mean like high A, high B to low A or above in your math course, you're doing well. And I, I open it more from more than just the math class with the science class. Now I do want people who have that kind of science mind initially, all right, because you'll have some students who are, but that doesn't mean it's, it's limited to that, right? Can you think logically? So when I sat down to write the requirements or the prerequisites for my particular AP computer science principles course, I was much wider. And my administrator was like, well, they if they can't do this and they can't think. And I was like, well, computer science principles specifically is supposed to be an entry level course. So if we don't and I don't know anything that's entry level where students automatically come in knowing the content. If that's the case then a lot of things, I wouldn't be a teacher, you know, I wouldn't have gone to college. If that, if, if that was going to be the measure by which we had students, are we allowed, and I put that in quotations on purpose, we allow students the privilege of coming into computer science, then we're no better and we're no further along in education than when we were with Brown versus Board of Education. And I really feel strongly about that. You know, if we are trying to grant access and we want to enact, if I'm supposed to, as a teacher, enact research-based practices in my math class. So if it's if, it, if you say formative assessments that have no grade attached to them, allow students to be more honest about where they are in learning, right? And I'm supposed to do those things in my classroom, then let me do those things in my classroom. The flip side of that coin is, well, if taking down these barriers for students to actually get into computer science, one of the things, okay, hiring faculty that looks like them, right? Um, hiring or offering mentorships to these programs, relaxing these very stringent standards with respects to math and science as an entry, you know, a gate into, pun intended, got gates, right? Um, a gate into computer science for these students, like kind of relaxing that strategy, looking like what are the skills that those soft skills specifically that are gonna need be needed later. And then like David said, if this student may not necessarily be going to a school to become a computer scientist. However, all of these skills, all of these skills that these students are gonna learn through computer science are going to be necessary. If you wanna be a writer, you wanna write a novel, you have to begin with the end in mind. Well, you know, some people do like, where do you want the heroine to end up? Well, what are all the things that have to happen before you get there, right? Computer science is one of those gateways. So as soon as we start putting all of these, you know, gates in, in place, um, so we as, as advocates for our students, and I say advocate for the students that we don't even know yet, it's kind of our responsibility to go to the administration, go to the counselors and be like, you know, what students do you know of who just think logically? And then, you know, putting on our boots and going to those Algebra One courses, courses, not the ones that are necessarily honors, maybe the ones that are attached to a support class, right? And like, who likes to game? You know, who's into gaming? And then I really, you know, feel strongly about what Georgia Tech's Constellations program did this past year in exposing the population to computer science in a different setting, you know, where they don't have to come after school. Cause then you're, once again, you're already limiting, delimiting you know, self-selection, okay? Students who are already interested are gonna come. Um, and then showing all of the different parts of it. I know we had it in North Atlanta. It was great, like the way that my school was set up, it just really lended itself as well to have students be engaged and see us in many different ways. So those are some things that I also wanted to be mindful of that we are, we are agents of change really as educators. And we have to, when our administrators come at us with research, we have to know what the research says back. So when we're asking for more girls in our classes, when we're asking for more, for more African-American students, Latinx students to be placed in our classes, it's not just like, well, it looks good. No, 
The research says when you have a more diverse population, the research says that this is what this is what our next generation is, correct? You know, there are politicians, there are artists, there are teachers. Um, so we have to kind of act as agents of change in our own building and kind of ask for what we know is right. Um, you know, with kind of a soft touch too, because it can't be too forceful. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll make a quick point uh, about, you know, this, I think we were talking about this and I know we have a lot of educators, but like the, you know, the, 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 the framework that we're working in is that computer science is scarce, that it's an elective class and that there's really only room for a select group of students. And so I think when you come with those boundaries, then opportunities will be selective. Um, so, I, you know, I think, what we're talking about is also in tandem with ramping up ex access, uh, maybe even requirement changes to where a computer science class can either substitute um, a required course. Because I think what happens is, is we're targeting lower, lower classmen. And sometimes the students who come kind of advanced already will have this gap and that gap gives them this space for an elective. While students who might be like, even their sophomore year having to retake a class, computer science is out of the question at that point. So, and you know, so there's, there's a lot of moving parts here. And then we, so this is what we're noticing as teachers that the student doesn't have to come fully required. Like there's, you know, math class is a little bit different. There's an expectation they have a great basic knowledge for us to teach them the next step. With my class, I found a lot of students, they didn't know anything. And some of the students who were kind of like, I don't even know if I like computers, were like the best. I mean, so it was just one of those things to, to keep, you're fishing out there for people who might not even know are gonna accept. So it's, to me, that scarcity is the problem. Maybe we can just, I don't know, have a, have a more, more opportunities for students, I think is always gonna improve our pool. Um, one of the points that, one of the talking points that we didn't want to talk about was what drew in, and since we're talking to educators, I wanted to talk about what drew in our students and also what did repel them. So what were some of the things that you thought drew in your students and what were some of the things you thought repelled them? Oh, your audio went away. Are you muted? Oh. That's my fault, I muted myself. Um, so we use code HS. And so one of the things that kind of repelled them was, um, and this is with any student, any content, is having to be on a program the whole entire class. So next year, I'm going to be more interactive um, using some of those things. And whatever program you're deciding to choose or use, it's a suggestion that I would just have. Like the class has to be, the nature of computer science is problem solving. We're trying to inherently instill this skill in our students, I'm gonna make it more interactive. That was the first thing that repelled them having to be on this particular content and finish these things, right? Um, things that drew them in were the times when we were actually doing activities that made them take what they learned in Code HS or whatever um, warm up or intro lesson that we had and they had to produce something. For example, it took all of my strength not to help this one particular student with his um, his create task, not create task, the explore task, which has gone away. Um, he wanted to look at, I'll just say he wanted to look at iPods, okay? I wouldn't let him tell me anything else. Of course, as teachers, we're all like the best ear hustlers ever. So I was able to hear him during the portion where he could talk to other students about his thinking and what he wanted to do. I was amazed at some of the thought processes that he had talking about the comp computational portion of the iPods. Um, there was another student who, just to be fair, 90% of the time, this, this dude just played games in my class. He did. It was just, you know, it was the reality of our life. Um, however, when it came down to the create task, the, the robustness of the questions that he asked before actually writing the code um, I was really surprised about it because I, I just thought he was goofing off. And I was like, Lord, help me. If this is going to fail my class because he's not doing any of the work in Code HS. But, you know, so then it, it begs the question, like, can you fail a student 
who ask such robust robust questions, but they don't have the content done. You know, so that's so when you talk about repelling and drawing in, okay, so next year, you know, I'm not going to use code HS so much in the classroom. It's gonna be more like, look, this is your homework. Module whatever, section whatever has to be done. You know, sometimes we will, and then but from the perspective of like a flipped classroom. You have to know these things. So when you come to class next time, we can actually do these activities related to that. How about you, David? Yeah, I definitely found that. So we used Code HS and to kind of cre to use that as the only instructional material was lacking. And in some ways, what repelled the students was over time, there was a sense of repetition and they got bored. So the, it wasn't necessarily challenging that got them out of it. It was just more of that, like, oh, I can do this. I know how to do it. And so what I found was I needed to incorporate more of these, we call them unplugged activities. And what I found was the, the ones that worked the best were ones you could use partners or like teams. And one was a binary uh, like puzzle. Like, so I made like really weird binary math problems that no one would ever do. But I just figured, hey, they can, so let's try it. And I broke the class into three groups. And next thing you know, there's just like this, now this one's greater than this one's, and they're like writing out, explaining. So you have that like discourse that like we wouldn't get out of like uh, a line of code. This line of code is just there. It's not really interesting sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's not, and there's not that confidence of, of like a discussive environment of like, I know I'm right because I believe this. And so you had this like passion. So, Anytime I can create that like passion to like discuss, I mean, and, and it's one of those things where I like to take some credit at the same time. I want to give a lot of credit to the students who, you know, are, are, are ready. This was my first, uh, I had a first period class. Sometimes they're, they're still waking up and to kind of energize that classroom um, was, was really something that I was inspiring and, you know, kept me going through that first year being a first year teacher. Um, and then the, um, so any, any hands-on stuff, but then uh, at the same time, what I found was if I broke it down into bite-sized pieces, mm -hmm. sometimes computer science feels, you know, you watch a movie, it's like the hacker, there's a bunch of code. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and they were like, well, that's computer science. I need to get to that level. And he's like, no, 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 no. Let's just do these bite-sized things. And then, you know, um, and, and then the next, the next, let's create a space where another student can teach their peer. Yeah. So anytime I'm, you know, I think branching out of just watching the video, typing some code, but where there's actual collaboration and physical, like touching something that is, that is an idea about computer science, those things I think just really just brought uh, brought that class into a really exciting space. And so it got it got students who normally were like, well, I don't know how to code that well. They were the ones who were like, well, I can I can do this. We played um, like an internet simulator game. Mm -hmm. Well, they can do that because they love talking on the phone with their friend. Like it just felt comfortable for them. Or I can like a like a chat room. So when when we're saying, hey, can you text? Well yes, some of these some of these students who knew how to code well they're not on Instagram and the, co and the students who are on Instagram when we did the chat activity were like rock stars. So I guess just like we're talking about that differentiation, we'll call it, of getting away from just a single computer science is terminal typing a code, seeing if it runs an error, correcting it, and then it says hello world. That is, uh, that's a very like specific thing. And I think the principles class is really all doesn't focus on on a lot of other things right so we have about five minutes did you all want to touch on anything else before we uh, start fielding questions i think i'm ready for questions okay yeah so we're opening it up now for questions um if you have a specific question for one of the teachers you can add them or if it's just a general question for either oh i don't know why this is no questions from the audience so I, I have on the Mentimeter. I think I had one that I copied earlier. Um, April was asking about teachers being trained and taking the gaze. Did you all want to talk about that? 
So um, I'm in a program through Atlanta Public Schools. We have a relationship with the seismic program. And so I'm electing to do Northwest, Northwest RESA for Georgia has a program where you can get an endorsement. Um, I really need that because I don't have a working knowledge of computer science. So I really need to go and be taught a lot of things. Um, and because as a teacher, I, I can always recognize a teacher who's really weak on their pedagogy, not pedagogy, but content knowledge. And I don't want to be that. So, yes, we do have the case. Um, I'm electing not to take it. I'm electing to do an, an endorsement program to get my certification. And I think at our, our morning session, this was brought up. Um, and the case, uh, to me and, I, and, the, and the, the panelists agreed, is probably more for someone out in the industry wanting to switch careers. Um, and I want to say that's probably what a lot of the gays is geared for is someone switching careers. I have the content knowledge. I don't necessarily have the pedagogy and the mm -hmm. gays kind of like combines them, but it's heavy on content knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's a good avenue, especially if we're trying to build up computer science as a profession in the state of Georgia, uh, just to really have a call, you know, qualification through exam, whatever you, however you feel about that qualification through exam um, serves, uh, serves a role, but I think that there's um, other avenues that are just as qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question from Sarah. Um, what resources were most helpful to teaching your first year of CS? How did you find them? So I used the Code HS a lot. Um, it was the background for a lot of the content knowledge or a lot of the curriculum for my students. But I did bring in Code.org, I think has great um, video lessons around the non-program language pieces to computer science, maybe internet, um, binary, uh, digital information, compression, more conceptual stuff. And then Khan Academy has a great computer science curriculum um, that I think is good practice. Um, for me, I use a lot of code.org and then um I only supplemented for places where I saw my students were really like kind of struggling um, conceptually only because, like I said, I came in in October. So the first semester was I mean, the first quarter was already done when I came back. So a lot of the foundation um, that I would have liked to establish with my students, I was not able to have that. Um, so I had to kind of lean on Code HS for a lot of help. However, um, for instance, for abstraction and algorithms, I did a lot of like unplugged activities where students had to think through things and really explain. Um, and I always said, explain it to me like I'm stupid. And I hate to say it that way, but like break it all the way down. You know, and if you can if you can teach me or you can explain it to me on that level, then then I know you know it. Um, so but next year, some program, some things that I am going to use, I'm going to incorporate are um, I'll be teaching AP Computer Science A, so CS um, Awesome. I'm going to use in conjunction with Code HS. I'm not. I'm probably never going to come away from a course that's going to auto grade for me. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I don't want to look at if my classes are going to stay as large as they are, which they probably are, because my goal is to get as many students in CS as possible. That part of it, I need this to be automated. And um, a couple of students, and I'll be real quick because I we're at time, aren't we? Yes. Um, they would be like, "Well, I wrote the code and it should work." I'm like, "You're right." And I said one student in particular. I said, "Well, yeah, your code is much sexier than the actual what Code HS says your solution should be, right?" And I said, "What? Well, think about it from this perspective. If you're being hired or contracted, or um, you're working in a particular um, job." and they ask you to do something a very specific way using a very specific set of functions or parameters, you got to kind of yield to what they want. You know, so even though your code is sexier, it's more streamlined, keep your code, maybe lobby for yourself, but you kind of kind of have to follow the rules. And I was like, that's kind of what code, that's how I explained, you know, code HS, that one particular part. But I loved it because it did what we needed it to do. 
it auto graded. I could really see where the students were having their issues and take those items and do unplugged activities. So we're running out of time, but if you do have any more um, questions you would like to ask our rock stars personally, you can email them. Do y'all want to type in your emails in the chat? Absolutely. And Lynn, did you want to uh, close out? Yes. You go well, first. I, did. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you again for coming back on uh, for um, for the summit and leading this discussion and uh, allowing our participants to meet you and um, you know being able to connect with them I think it makes a huge difference as we're emphasizing and supporting the building of this you know teacher community uh, uh, not just here in Georgia but really across the nation so thank you for your willingness to do that. Um, I, I think it, regardless of whether you're a first year teacher or you know new to computing or with minimal experience that there are invaluable lessons to be learned and shared all around. And so I appreciate your time, your commitment and all the work that you do. Um, it, the audience is very eager to connect with you. <laughs> so uh, I hope that you'll stay on uh, and continue to stay with us throughout the day today and tomorrow so that they have an opportunity to meet you um, uh, outside of this uh, segment. Terry, thank you so much for facilitating. Um, yes, and uh, thank you all. We are at uh, lunch time right now we are doing a lunch and learn every day so if you'd like to um stick with us throughout this segment go grab some lunch something quick to bite and be back here on stage at 12 45 for a wonderful discussion with um dr caitlin dooley we're super excited about that too thank you all for your time Thank y'all. Thank you.